entrepreneurship, real estate, trending news. There's no business like minding your own. This is the Minding Your Business Podcast. Here's your host, Ron Brooks. Yeah, yeah, this is Ron Brooks, and this is the newly revamped uh, The Minding Your Business podcast, formerly known as the I Really Mean It podcast. So glad you could join on Friday, January the 19th of 2018. Um, You might ask, well, why the hell am I so excited? Today's my 37th birthday, so I am uh, definitely... um, Excited, definitely uh, pumped up about today, as I am about every day, and uh, so that's no different, but man, I'm excited. Justin, what's going on, brother? Um, Good brother, uh, Justin, that's representing uh, Memphis out in LA, Uh, good brother I grew up with. Uh, Marlene, how you doing? Uh, Good afternoon. Thank you for joining. Um, Man, I'm excited about my birthday. I'm here. I'm I'm working from home again today. Many of you, some of you had kids go back to school after about a week long break, uh, their extra extension of uh, Christmas break. Um, from those on the podcast, I am on Facebook Live uh, as well and uh, talking to some of the folks on here. Uh, here in Memphis, we had uh, some ice and snow that came in on last week and it's kind of had the city down a little bit. Uh, you know, so Justice, what did I, what did I call you, man? I need to start calling you Judge. That's what I need. To. <laughs> man, oh my God, Judge Justice, um, the Judge man, uh, great brother out there in uh, California. Uh, man, I don't even know what I called you, man. I thought I called you Justice, but uh, maybe I need to call you Judge. Oh, Justin. Oh, okay. So you, you changed it up on me. No, oh, okay. So Justin, man. Nonetheless, he's a big Memphis advocate and he's doing his thing out there in LA. And that's really what counts. Uh, great brother there. Uh, White Station Spartan, uh, representative alumni there. Great brother. D. Ross, Boss Ross. What's going on, man? What's going on? Oh, Justin says that the uh, judge is good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I like that. Miss Spencer, how you doing? Um, but man, thank you so much again. Today's my 37th birthday. Thank you to everybody. All the well wishes, um, the celebration, everything. You know, I'm excited about it. Uh, every year is another year of growth, another year of opportunity. And uh, I don't take that lightly. So I'm very grateful to uh, see another year at 37. You know, one of the things I found out, man, is I, I get... Uh, a little older, which is crazy to be 37 because it, it wasn't that long ago. I was 20, 21. And I'm sure a lot of y'all can say that too. Um, you know, I find out that my, my, um, my BS meter starts to fluctuate a little bit more than it did when I was younger. Um, so my spidey senses are a little bit more in tune and I, I feel like, you know, I don't, I don't have as much time for, for BS, like I, I felt like maybe I used to. I used to uh, be real patient and kind of entertain a lot of foolishness sometimes uh, when it came to people and things and processes. And now I don't seem to be quite as patient. Maybe I'm getting a little gruff in my old age, uh, but I don't seem to uh, be as uh, interested in a lot of excuses or a lot of BS or a lot of this and that, man. I seem to be ready to go towards it. Teresa Woodard, Good afternoon. Karanda Soror, what's going on? Good afternoon. Um, but again, the Minding Your Business podcast, um, what we want to go through today for today's show is just a few things. Um, one, in addition to celebrating my birthday, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what you can expect from the show going forward with the, the uh, change in the name and uh, some of the formatting changes and, and that kind of thing. And then I want to wrap up with uh, the announcement from Amazon with the 20 cities that uh, made the final cut for consideration for their second headquarters. They got their current headquarters in Seattle, Washington, and now they're going to be going to looking towards another city for another headquarters. And so there are 20 cities that made the final list, a list. Uh, unfortunately, Memphis, Tennessee was not 
one of the finalists. I will talk about uh, some of the reasons why. Uh, some may be obvious and some may not be. And then what Memphis can do uh, in the future, because I think it sets the, uh, the city up nice for opportunities in the future when you uh, join that kind of list amongst those type of cities. And then I'm going to give you what I feel like are going to be the top three cities uh, from my estimation, from some talks with some folks that I know within Amazon uh, that I've spoken with over the last several days. I'm going to share with you what I think is going to be uh, the landing spot, and then we're going to get out of here. So uh, that's the lineup for today. Um, Ms. Patterson, good afternoon. Uh, Shay, how you doing? Thank you so much, Teresa. Uh, Lavinda, thank you. Lamar Bowen, how you doing? Thank you for joining. And so a um, couple things, too, before we get started. Uh, also, uh, we have the new revamped website, so you could go to www.themybpodcast, so that's www.themybpodcast.com. That's where you can listen to the show and see other information. Uh, and, of course, please go out uh, if you're on iTunes in the App Store, uh, Google Play, uh, the Play Store. Uh, if you happen to be on SoundCloud or YouTube, go out and rate the show. Rate us positive, of course, uh, but certainly be honest and uh, go out and give us a rating. That does a great uh, thing with promoting the show and helping to uh, grow the show and the audience. And so that's what we want to be able to do right here. Um, also, make sure to check out uh, a few things that I've got going on. Uh, the R.G. Brooks Development Consortium, which is a uh, training platform for real estate and for uh, community kind of legacy living edification type uh, platforms to help uh, our community. You can go to rgbdc.org. That's rgbdc.org and uh, learn a little bit more about that. Um, also, my consulting business. So I'm working with actually three businesses right now uh, to help them kind of grow and edify their business. And uh, those will be coming on the podcast as well to talk about that. Um, but that's at brooksbrothersconsulting.com. So www.brooksbrothersconsulting.com. Brooks Brothers Consulting is where I work with uh, uh, various business owners to help them, um, you know, uh, manage through debt, manage through the planning process of their business, uh, whether they've been in business for some time or they're brand new or they just have an idea, uh, I'm able to leverage uh, my resources and leverage my expertise in starting up a business and uh, actually running it and getting it to uh, a certain scale. So those are some things I want to make sure that I share with you kind of early on. Uh, Mickey Renee, thank you so much, lady, uh, for the birthday wishes. Thank you for joining, Terrence. Uh, Felicia Barnes, good afternoon to you. Joya, what's going on? Cuzzo Lisa, what's going on? South Kakalaki representing right there. Um, so anyway, let me jump right in. Um, so the, I've been asked and I've received some inboxes um, and some different things. Uh, let's see. Uh, is this it? Yeah. Roberto saying Ron at V. So it's not V, uh, Roberto. It's Ron at V. T H E M Y B. So Mary Yellow Brown podcast dot com. So it's Ron at V M Y B podcast dot com. Um, so I received inboxes and uh, information and questions about why change the name from the I Really Mean It podcast to the Minding Your Business podcast. And, you know, as I looked at it, so this is our 30th episode. We started August, around August 11th of 2017. Um, so I'm uh, definitely grateful for kind of where we are. And, you know, one of the reasons for the name change, y'all, is I wanted to be able to begin um, kind of promoting the show kind of at a, um, a larger scale. And one of the things that you when you look at in business is you want to make sure, particularly in podcasting, um, but even with any business name is you want to make sure that when people see your work or your entity, that they have some idea of what it is prior to even reading about it, prior to you telling them about it and that kind of thing. Uh, the I Really Mean It podcast, when you think of the word or the phrase, I really mean it, 
uh, it doesn't really tell, at least in, in talking with some mentors and looking at it within myself, it doesn't really give a sense of what the show's about. So what you have to do then is you have to then read the description. You have to listen to some shows and things like that. And you know that attention spans are really short uh, these days. And so people don't allow you the luxury of a lot of time to go through that kind of progression because there's so many different podcasts. There's so many different things coming at all of us, right, all the time. So you got to be able to strike really fast. And so in looking at that and looking at the, the show content and things like that, and for those of you that know me, know that uh, I had a business at one point in time that I since have sold that was called Minding Your Business. And so being able to readopt uh, that name and have it be a nice fit so that when you pull up the show and you see Minding Your Business, you know exactly what you're getting. You know exactly what I'm going to be talking about. You know I'm going to be more than likely talking about some form of business, right? Um, so it's not going to be kind of just like all over the place. So the three things that are going to make up uh, the content of the show, um, number one being entrepreneurship. And if you've been listening to the podcast, you know that um, my take on entrepreneurship is, is kind of slightly different because I like to make sure that one, I define what entrepreneurship is and entrepreneurship takes a, a number of different forms. Uh, you've seen me refer to myself actually as an entrepreneur. And so I'll talk more about that. And I've talked about that on previous podcast shows. But um, there's entrepreneurship, there's business ownership. And sometimes those are different depending on which lane that you're taking. They're not one and the same. Uh, oftentimes what we like to do is combine business ownership and entrepreneurship and use entrepreneurship as the one umbrella, which is fine. But um, it goes a little bit deeper than that. So I really want to dig into that and and provide best practices on uh, whether you're working a nine to five job and you need to have an entrepreneurship mindset on the job, either to grow to the next level or to be the best that you are within it and to be able to develop that, whether you have uh, a business on the side of your job, which many have, or you're looking to transition from uh, your nine to five job life into being a entrepreneur or a business owner full time. Uh, I want to be able to provide information, best practices, guests on the show, things like that, so that this becomes a, a, a source of um, inspiration and an informative source for you all uh, as you go on your walk, whichever way that takes. So this isn't a bash work in a job type uh, show. As a matter of fact, it's funny when people do that because um, there was a time where you'd see it in your timelines where people are bashing people work a job. I guarantee you go challenge somebody who's got a business to say, I'm not going to accept any money from anybody who got it from working a job and see what happens to their business if they did that. <laughs> right. So there's no business that's turning down any money from anybody just because they made it working for somebody else. Matter of fact, having a balance of that is really what makes the diversity and the economy really go. Everybody can be a business owner and entrepreneur, right? How many of y'all have sold things to or your product or things like that to someone that's purely 100 percent entrepreneur? Right. So you need a balance of, of the two. You have to have you know some people who have you know the desire to work a job. They need to be able to do that. And then some people have to be owners and you have to have a balance of that. But within all of that, everyone can have the ownership mentality. And so that's different than everybody being an actual owner themselves. So we'll talk about that. Um, second is real estate. One of the things that people know about me, uh, if you've done business with me or you're familiar with me, is that I'm an avid lover and investor in real estate. Um, and that takes many different forms, not so much from a, a capitalistic standpoint of, you know, how I personally gain. Although I've done well in real estate, I've taken L's in real estate as well. Um, so I, I've had the experience of both. But real estate as a legacy building um, platform and going back to what I was just saying before, y'all, uh, real estate as uh, a, a mindset of ownership. You know, one of the things that edifies, and I've, I've talked to some people, um, talked to my good friend uh, Gil Carter with the First Year Foundation Incorporated. Uh, we had a conversation the other night, and I was sharing with him about the the mindset of ownership, 
one of the things that edifies our community is when people have that mindset and they're uh, think towards ownership because it gets them thinking at a higher level. When when you own something, think of how children are, you know, two, three years old. What's the first thing they say? You know, when they have something in this in their hand, they feel like they own it. They say that's mine. Right. And they protect it. And they're not looking to, to take from somebody else because I've got mine. Right. And then how does mine become a resource if I'm willing to share it? Then I'm willing to share whatever I feel like I own with somebody. But I make sure that it's known that I own it. Right. And then if I continue to develop that, then what may happen is now I, I show other people how they can own their own. And so that's really my approach to real estate. So you know, I'm not going to share with you that you're going to get rich quick and that you're going to you know, do all these kind of different uh, you know, things to make a bunch of personal income and money for yourself. So not from a materialistic standpoint, but from the mindset ownership and the, abil- the ability to then edify the community and show growth within our community, because that's really what we need. The, the big thing, when you see all the issues that we have, whether it's here in Memphis or uh, you go around, it's because we've lost that sense of ownership, owning your own means of production and not waiting for someone else to provide that for me or to give me that. You have to go get it. And everything's not, you know, owning real, estate's not, or real estate is not about do I have this pocket full of money and or this great credit score or this or that. You know, don't use those as barriers. Right. Many people have acquired and done really well in real estate without either of the two and not in any kind of gimmick or not any kind of underhand under under the table type stuff. So we want to be able to talk about, again, the best practices with that. I'm actually going to have Wayne Moody, uh, who is uh, heavy into real estate. I look to have James Harvey. Many of you that are heavy in the real estate, I'd like to have you come on the show and share some of your best practices and um, hopefully be able to entertain referrals and things like that. And different avenues that you can go in real estate um, because there there's so many different ways you can go with real estate, with land and, and whatnot. The third thing is we'll talk about some trending news topics like we will today with the Amazon HQ, where we'll talk about the, the 20 cities that made uh, the finalist cut. But what I want to do with the trending news topic is... So, you know me, I'm not going to talk about the whole gossip of what goes behind a story. Right. So if you go back and listen to our episode back in September, I believe it was where we talked about the culture of sexual harassment. If you notice on that particular podcast, y'all, I didn't talk about uh, any particular one person and you know what I feel about them or this or that. I more talked about it from a best practice standpoint on how you can make sure one that you avoid that men and women. And or if you have to mitigate that ways that you can do that. Um, So I'm not getting into trending news to be gossipy or to uh, get into anybody's business or try to take a side of who's right and who's wrong and things like that. But one of the things I like about with trending news, um, particularly for those of us that are of a, a higher mindset, is what are the lessons that you can learn? Uh, And not just taking advantage of someone's folly, but what are the lessons that we can all learn, right, and best practices to avoid or to take advantage and have an opportunity to be able to do something else? Um, So taking those trending news topics and being able to provide those best practices is what we want to be able to do here on the Minding Your Business podcast. Um, So we'll have some guests. You'll hear from me. You'll hear from some other people. Um, I'm mobile. So as you've seen, like last week, I was crazy as hell enough to do the podcast outside uh, in the freezing temperature. I've been to uh, people's offices. you know, you know, like my guy, Paul Young, who's the director of uh, housing and development with the city of Memphis. Um, I've been in the office with Brittany Thornton with uh, Juice Orange Mound, and I've got several others that uh, are going to be a part of the show. So we're going to have a great time. I want it to be informative for you. Um, you can uh, catch me on Twitter, on Facebook uh, and whatnot. And uh, you can email me again at Ron at the mybpodcast.com and uh, you can share uh, information if you want to be on the show, if you want to uh, provide feedback as far as things on the show, you can do that. Madonna Sanders, how you doing? 
Uh, Marvin, what's going on? My guy Marvin in Dallas, Texas, man. Uh, great fam right there. Marcus Tolbert, how you doing? Um, thank you so much, Chris Taylor, uh, for the birthday wishes. Jermaine Fletcher, my guy, uh, goes way back in the industry, man. Great brother, uh, Jermaine Fletcher. Uh, Miss Rochelle, how you doing? Kim Woods, how you doing? What's going on, y'all? Thank you again for listening. Uh, for those who are on the podcast, those are folks that are on the Facebook Live uh, feed uh, as we have that right now. So all minds are clear, so you understand what we're going to be doing on the podcast going forward. Uh, actually, in next week's show, uh, we've got uh, something lined up for you where I'm going to talk about balancing personal and professional responsibility, which is a big thing as we have goals Many of you have stated that you have goals going into 2018. And one of the things that we all have to balance, right, is how do we manage our personal life and our professional life so that uh, we could achieve the type of success. So I want to talk about that and some best practices. And, and I'm going to share with you a story um, of where I fell short on both, right, and how it impacted me and how you can avoid uh some of my folly. (laughs) Right. And so that's what it's about. You know, this is authentic podcast. Um, There's no fancy editing. There's no fancy whatnot. You just get me in the raw form. And I hope that um, this could be a platform to help uh, many of you. So feel free to share the podcast uh, and talk about it and uh, whatnot. Uh, If you want to join, you can join on. If you comment, um, let me on, Ron, then you can actually join the podcast if you like to. Um, and if you want to join on on some of the discussion. So here's what we're going to do. Um, there were 20 cities that for Amazon that were selected. So 235 cities put a bid in with Amazon, uh, who is headquartered out of Seattle, Washington. They um, narrowed that down over the last several months. I think initially the... Um, 235 cities put their bid in back in September, I believe. And so now they've taken, they've got through the holidays, they've narrowed that 235 city list down to 20. All right. And so I want to go through the 20 cities real quick with you all and feel free to share uh, your thoughts. If you happen to be here on Facebook live or you are listening to this via the podcast version and you want to go to the website, you can leave comments there. Uh, you can go to my Facebook page, Ron Brooks, or at Champ Ron on Instagram and Twitter. So I'm going to go through the list real quick. So number 20 is Los Angeles. So shout out to my guy, uh, Justin out there, Judge, uh, good longtime brother again. He's out there in L.A. So number 20 is L.A. So if you think about um, what Amazon's using to kind of judge uh, what cities they're going to select. Obviously, they want um, a city that's going to have progression in uh, transportation. So the ability to uh, transport a large mass of people, uh, particularly in public transportation, um, is believed to be something that they're looking at. Um, they want to tie to some kind of um, tech infrastructure, right? Particularly with engineers. And I'm going to talk about that uh, because my contact shared this with me that is not just solely um, people in the tech industry, but engineers is something that they're looking for. So the access to engineers that come out of engineering programs that could come right into Amazon and contribute immediately and to be able to retain them throughout their career is something that's interesting to them. Um, The other thing that's interesting for them is the ability to travel. So they need to be able to travel from whatever city they select to get back to Seattle and get to some different areas in the country. So those are just some basic things, y'all, that, you know, Amazon has stated overtly that they're looking for. Um, So number 20 is Los Angeles. Um, Of course, you're familiar with uh, the City of Angels out in California. Um, Roughly about five, six million people or so that are in uh, their metropolitan area. So it's very densely populated. Um, The business infrastructure in L.A. is going to be tough. 
they have a really tough tax structure. And then, you know, and Justice Justin could probably come in and tell y'all uh, traffic is, is a nightmare <laughs> in L.A., as it is with some other cities. Um, L.A., of course, has Hollywood. They've got um, uh, some definitely some good uh, you know businesses that are housed there and things like that. So uh, there's some definitely plus they have the climate, of course. And so Amazon's tied to Hollywood. Uh, is fairly strong and that's going to continue to grow. So Los Angeles has some, um, you know, certainly some opportunity to be able to be considered, but um, I, I'm not really sure that LA is really going to be on their list. So you, then you've got uh, number 19, I'm going to Columbus, Ohio. So Columbus, Ohio, uh, if you think about it, so climate, uh, they're going to take a hit on. Um, they do have kind of a Midwestern kind of charm to it. Uh, and then travel from Columbus to Seattle is going to be a pain in the ass, <laughs> right? Um, by, you know, certainly by plane or whatnot. You can, you're not really going to travel there by ground too much from there. But if you need to fly executives in and that kind of thing, that's not easy to do. Uh, matter of fact, it'd be easier for them to do it from Cincinnati. But uh, Cincinnati was not on the list. Even Cleveland would have been uh yeah a uh much better maybe pick than Columbus, Ohio. Uh Columbus also doesn't necessarily have the um bedrock community of engineers and tech people and, and that kind of thing. Quan Todd, what's going on, brother? Uh Frat right there. Uh Sharon McKinney, what's going on? Sister Nicole, what's going on? Dr. Durden, Dr. Diva Durden. And, uh, Rennell, how you doing, lady? What's going on? Good afternoon. Um, so Columbus, Ohio, I'm not really sure, y'all, that they're going to really be selected. They, they have some challenges. Um, then you got Indianapolis, it, uh, Indiana, which is actually <laughs> not much different than Columbus, right? They, they still have, you know, again, these cities have some attractive pieces to them. Uh, Indianapolis, obviously, you'd have to go on the outskirts. Um, to be able to uh, have something with that size of campus uh, for Amazon, but they're a little, they're kind of bland, you know, in Indianapolis. There's not a whole, there's not a whole lot of frills, that kind of thing. Again, you got the Midwestern charm. Um, I've spent some time personally uh, in Indianapolis. I haven't lived there, uh, but I have traveled there for business and, and that kind of thing. Um, and I actually had a great time in downtown Indianapolis. Um, so next, you've got uh, Denver, Colorado. Denver, Colorado is, is interesting. Um, it obviously, it's a very attractive city. Uh, from a climate standpoint, you've got some variability there. Uh, certainly, they can have some tough winters in Denver. Um, the, they do have a nice transportation hub. They are attractive for their resorts and their skis, skiing and that kind of thing. Um, the one thing, and I've, I've lived a little bit and spent some time in Seattle, Washington, so Seattle and Denver are, are fairly similar to each other. So I'm not really sure that from my personal standpoint that Denver is really going to be uh, one that's going to be selected. They'll be in the mix, but um, you're also not going to get that East Coast feel of some of the tech uh, savvy um, infrastructure or, or whatnot coming through Denver. Although you do have a growing um, millennial population there, which could be attractive. Um, you got my next one is Miami, Florida. So um, Miami, you, so you got South Beach, right, uh, which is very attractive. Obviously, you've got the climate, <laughs> one of the best climates in this country uh, down in Miami. Uh, one thing with Miami is the, the business infrastructure, from what I've researched, uh, leaves a little bit to be desired. You can certainly travel from Miami to Seattle, although that could get you know cross country like that. Could get a little expensive coming out of Miami. Um, although Miami has a great climate, Miami also has the uh, propensity to get caught in, like we saw last year and in other years past, uh, in hurricane season. You can uh, run into some issues there uh, with Miami. But, um, you know, business from a tax standpoint in Florida, uh, you've got a few challenges. Um, so I, I don't really see Miami really being in the mix too much. Um, I think there's some other areas that they'll look to. And then um, the last thing is Miami has some of the same challenges that I'll speak about with Memphis in terms of uh, the developing and an ongoing workforce and the ability to retain 
uh, workers as you go through life's progression. So number 15, uh, I rated Nashville. Uh, Nashville is a little bit closer to our hearts here in Memphis. Uh, Music City is definitely grown over the last uh, couple decades. Uh, they're the capital here in Tennessee. Amazon has some uh, existing infrastructure in Nashville already, which makes it attractive. Obviously, Tennessee, as a right to work uh, state with no state income tax, uh, makes it very attractive. Um, one of the challenges that Nashville has that uh, in my contact at Amazon has shared with me that they don't have they're not necessarily a destination for engineering talent. Um, they do have some growing entrepreneurship communities and that kind of thing. Um, however, there's a challenge with attracting uh, and uh, the city actually producing engineering talent, um, which is a kind of the lifeblood of Amazon uh, per se. So that's some of the challenges. You know, traveling from Nashville to other cities may be a challenge, too. Uh, Nashville's airport leaves a little bit to be desired, and some other cities are a little bit more progressive uh, than Nashville is with its ability to travel. But uh, Nashville does uh, have some attractiveness in its suburban areas with uh, Franklin and that kind of thing, Lebanon and you know Murfreesboro, kind of the outskirts that uh, could prove attractive. Nashville also has, obviously, the music and that kind of thing that uh, can be attractive to younger people uh, being able to come. And then the climate, obviously, uh, certainly compared to uh, Columbus, Ohio, or uh, uh, some of these other places, even Denver, uh, much better climate overall, warmer in Nashville. 14 next, and I'll go through some of these fairly fast. Um, you got Chicago. So obviously Chicago has one of the larger airports in the country. So there's definitely an ability to uh, travel in and out of Chicago to get to Seattle or get to other places. Um, business community, uh, you have a, a really tough time in Chicago. Um yeah, there's there's an old hat that kind of runs a lot of Chicago there and um, ciphering through some of that. There, there's kind of some thickness right there in ciphering through their business community. Um, you've got Boeing there uh, that, you know, could be a competitor, uh, not so much direct competitor with Amazon, but kind of a competitor in the fiduciary duty uh, side within the city. But centrally located um, climate, obviously, you get into some rough winters. Uh, potentially in Chicago, but uh, I think they fairly can be short lived. But when they're rough, they're, uh, they're rough. I was actually born uh, up there. So uh, when you get into a rough situation in the wintertime with Chicago, um, but there's a lot of just there's a lot of politics in Chicago that uh, you're going to have to navigate. So I'm not sure if Amazon's interested in that. Newark, New Jersey, nah, I mean, that's just home to Bon Jovi and, you know, a couple other folks. I don't really see Newark, New Jersey having the, the pizzazz, but they were selected, so they might have, uh, you know, definitely some opportunity. Uh, number 12, New York. Uh, New York, the Big Apple. Um, a few things with New York. Obviously, they're a mecca, they're, they're a hub. Um, are they kind of a hub for, you know, the the tech community? A little bit more on the financial side, uh, I would say, or at least in my opinion. Um, one of the things with New York is it, it's really big, um, it's really dense, and it's really expensive. Um, of the cities that were selected, New York is probably uh, closer on the the more expensive side. When I say expensive, I'm meaning uh, cost of living and things like that, y'all. So. Um, yeah, I don't, I really don't see New York. I've got them rated high because they're New York and they're definitely a draw. But um, I don't see you know uh, you know kind of your your tech community, your engineers really enjoying New York. And then you you definitely got some climate concerns there as well. Um, one city that's interesting, although I didn't rate them as high, is Toronto, Canada. Um, Toronto is obviously growing kind of in its uh, pizzazz and uh, you got rapper Drake and uh, Melanie Fiona and some different things uh, kind of driving some of the attention in Toronto. And then, of course, the Toronto Raptors have had a pretty decent basketball team over the last uh, four or five years. But um, you do have uh, some talent there. There's some tech talent in Toronto. Um 
you know, they got a challenge with climate. That's their big thing. Just like New York, it, it gets cold and you get a lot of snow and ice there uh, a good bit. But um, one of the things with Toronto that they have working in their favor, um, they do have a recent alliance that they've kind of done with Google Alphabet. Um, and that uh, is, is definitely attractive. They're also very uh, diverse from an immigration standpoint. So unlike, you know, there are other areas, some cities like New York's fairly diverse and that kind of thing. Uh, Toronto does have um, a nice sense of diversity uh, within its population that would prove to be attractive. All right. Number 10, uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. So you may not know a whole lot about Raleigh, North Carolina. They have they're surrounded by a lot of universities. So there's a lot of draw for talent. And just the state of North Carolina to begin with just has a plethora of um, really top rated universities and colleges and things like that that could possibly be a draw for talent. Climate wise, they could be attractive. Um their challenge is going to be travel from Raleigh to Seattle, um, although they do have some direct flights uh, from Raleigh to Seattle. Uh, it, it's probably just going to be too small and maybe too low of a profile uh, for Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, the other thing that you got to look at, too, with just the state of North Carolina is um, the bathroom bill <laughs> that uh, North Carolina was supportive of that is more than likely not going to be too attractive to leadership at Amazon uh, or any of its employees. Um, Atlanta. So you got ATL. Uh, I've got them at number nine. Um, they did make the list. Uh, Georgia Tech there in Atlanta is obviously a draw from the engineering and tech standpoint. Um, they're definitely a hub. So traveling from Atlanta to uh, other cities is definitely attractive. Um very congested traffic, <laughs> just like a lot of the other cities, New York and, and Chicago. A lot of the major cities have uh, traffic concerns, and Atlanta is no different. But Atlanta has uh, arguably the busiest airport uh, in the country. So there's, um, from a transportation standpoint, is where they do very well. Also, from a, um, you know, not just transportation, but from a climate standpoint. So Atlanta has, although they, they probably would argue that now, just like Memphis uh, in terms of uh, with the ice and snow, but typically Atlanta has a really good climate. So keep your eye on Atlanta. They're, they certainly could prove attractive. Dallas, Texas is next at number eight. Um, the state of Texas just in general has a nice um, uh, pipeline of engineers. And so... That is definitely attractive, like I said earlier. Um, they also have the land, the space, at least in their outskirts around Dallas, to be able to support that. Um, Texas is a draw for millennials. It is. If you look at Dallas, you look at Houston, you look at San Antonio. Um, we'll talk about Austin, Texas here in just a little bit. Um, there's definitely been a migration to Texas uh, from the state level. There's business friendly uh kind of legislation that's there in Texas. Uh, state income tax is, is reasonable, you know, or, or I'm not sure if Texas has state income tax or not. Um, but you, you definitely have some draw there, you know, certainly in Dallas. Philadelphia. Um, so I got Philadelphia number seven. Um, you know, there, Philadelphia is going through a lot of renaissance. Uh, there, there's some redevelopment projects. I was talking with my guy, or actually through, on Facebook, I responded on a post from my guy, Justin Spencer. Uh, I believe uh, he's traveling or has recently traveled up in that area. And uh, the city of brotherly love, uh, you got the attitude up there. Um, that's a little different. That's definitely not the uh, Southern Bell, Southern Charm <laughs> uh, kind of thing up there. But, um, you know, you. The cost is, is fairly high, so not quite as high as like New York or any of these places, but you do have a higher cost of living, uh, y'all in Philadelphia. Um, but, you know, with some of the renaissance that's going up there could prove attractive to Amazon, but I think less likely. Kind of the same thing with uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So if you stay in the state and you just go west, um, you've got, um, you, know, you know, Pittsburgh. So. Pittsburgh it does have a growing kind of tech community. Um, they're kind of they're kind of my dark horse contender because uh, 
Pittsburgh, you know, while they have some climate concerns, it's, it's not near what you see in Chicago or Denver or New York or, or some of these other places. So they tend to not get hit that tough. But one of the things that um, is attractive for Pittsburgh is the robotics piece, the engineering piece. Um, and uh, they have some investment in artificial intelligence uh, with some of the universities and things like that there in Pittsburgh that could prove to be uh, very attractive. Um, now I want to start getting into some of you know who I feel are going to be some of the top three. So now you're getting to Ron's top three cities that uh, I believe are going to really be uh, in the, the, the top contention for Amazon's headquarters. So as you get to number three, uh, Boston, Massachusetts. OK, so Boston has the engineering talent. They have several universities there that produce um, really good, talented students. So you have a pipeline there uh, that you can continue to milk if you're an Amazon to, to have more of a homegrown or, or attract people uh, to the city. It's, it's a very attractive city. Uh, their downtown and some of their areas are very historical. Um, I've uh, actually done some business and uh, the last few recent years I've spent uh, a short period of time in Boston, most of it downtown. Um, Of course, they've got the sports infrastructure. They've got um, the climate. You know, you don't really have that. They take some hits climate wise, but I think they make up for it um, with some strong investment from Amazon already. Uh, They've already been investing in Boston over the last few years. And I just believe that there is a, um, a a nice draw for you know millennials and whatnot to be able to come there or are, that are already there going to school to be able to stay there. So from a business community standpoint, too, unlike New York, not near as congested, I guess, for Boston, um, they don't, they're not huge in diversity. Um, so they don't really compare to like where I'll talk about D.C. in a little bit or um you know, even someplace like a New York or someplace like that, where it's probably a little bit more diverse population than you got in Boston. But um, Boston's attractive. Don't be surprised if, if, if they're strongly considered. Um, number two, Austin, Texas. So Austin, Texas, uh, Amazon has obviously uh, been involved in the purchase of Whole Foods, uh, which is based in Austin, along with Dell Computers and some other uh uh, major corporations that are, are housed down there. Um, you've got a huge uh, engineering talent that comes from the University of Texas, uh, along with um, you know just normal um, kind of tech majors and whatnot. And you've got a music scene that, although in a blasphemous sense, they've tried to compare to Memphis, <laughs> um, but nonetheless, they, if you ever spend some time there, they do have a, a really growing got a music scene which is nice for that live work play balance uh that you you try to have so um they're definitely a draw um you you know really progressive and i do believe um there's no state income tax in texas so that's obviously again a, a huge draw um the ability to travel from austin to say seattle or some other places may be somewhat of a challenge um but again they could make up for it with their already connection to whole foods um, you know, the whole Texas, you know, draw of talent and things like that. Um, so again, another one to not be surprised about, uh, even though, you know, profile wise, they may be smaller on a national scale, but Austin, Texas could be, uh, a nice draw. So before I get to the number one city that I think is going to attract and actually land the Amazon headquarters, let me tell y'all a little bit about why, Memphis was not included in this uh, list of 20. Um, We could easily sit here and I could do the show and I could sit here probably till 12 o'clock in the morning and we could all talk about all the challenges of Memphis. Right. And again, that's not what this show or this particular podcast is about. Um, We're going to come with the real. And so we're going to be authentic. But Memphis has some positives, too, that I believe would have been considered. Um, One is the connection to FedEx and the hub. And then Amazon's already made uh, some pretty significant investment here in Memphis in terms of, um, uh, you know, warehousing and and things like that. So from a distribution standpoint, Memphis makes a lot of sense. 
Um, climate wise, Memphis makes a lot of sense. Again, although uh, y'all probably chuckle at that, considering what we've dealt with over the last week here in Memphis, right? Nonetheless, Memphis has a very attractive uh, climate. And ge- the geographic location of Memphis is very attractive because you can get to a lot of major cities within eight hours, within an eight hour drive or a short flight. So there's a lot of cities that you can touch or get to uh, from Memphis, Tennessee, where Memphis falls short. Uh, and there's some obvious reasons is one, it does not have the engineering talent at any kind of scale. It does not have it doesn't produce the tech graduates and things like that, nor does it draw those folks to the city. Uh, some of the challenges that we're all aware of. And, and it's not that other cities don't have this challenge is that Memphis has in the start reality is uh, the business climate is, is improving. And uh, Joanne Massey and her team with uh, the Office of uh Uh, Business and diversity is continuing to push the envelope, but that has to continue. And I think uh, we can eventually get there. But there's some other entities in play that uh, are present challenges to that as well. Um, And, you know, the the dual government piece, it it makes the business community or, or the attractiveness, you know, not quite as there, particularly when comparing with other cities. Because when you come to Memphis, you've got to deal with two sets of governments. Um, they've done a better job of trying to unify, but they're not completely unified because there's not one metro. And so you've got to deal with two mayors, two different offices, you know, doing things. And so that sometimes that proves to be maybe not as attractive. Um, but the big thing is the workforce. The, um, Memphis has yet to get to a point where it produces the type of talent that is sustainable for a business that's going to hire 50,000 people uh, unless they'd have to do a good bit of it or more from outside the city, which presents some benefits economically, but then also presents challenges because you have a, then you have a company from a fiduciary standpoint that is not hiring from the community in which it it sits. So they, they would essentially make billions of dollars just out of Memphis's back door without really incorporating Memphis people to help do that. And then to be able to give back. So, um, there's some things that obviously Memphis has to work on. There are other things, too, that I haven't mentioned, but um, there, those are some stark things that Memphis would have to work on uh, to be able to uh, definitely get to uh, being on this list. But I do commend the city for and the, the county for putting their name in the hat and having some real conversations with Amazon uh, that, uh, from my understanding, were had. And it allows for Memphis to work on some things and also be considered for some things in the future, even if it's not uh, the second headquarters, because uh, you can imagine that Amazon's going to continue to grow. They're going to continue to own everything. Uh, pretty soon, everything's going to be owned by Google or Amazon. And so uh, there'll be uh, mounting pressure and opportunity in the future for a third and maybe even a fourth headquarters, whether those continue to be in the United States or they go abroad. So uh, Memphis should continue to hold its head up, but you, we've got to work on. And that's why I talk about ownership. We've got to incorporate the ownership mentality so that we can begin positioning ourselves in a nice light with these other cities. And mitigate what our natural challenges are and highlight uh, the positives. So number one. So we've gone through that whole list to get to the number one city. And this is a city near and dear to my heart. I actually did a show when this was first announced. uh, I did a podcast somewhere around uh, September 15th or whatnot when I happened to be uh, at Impact Hub D.C., which I believe is changing its name as a co-working place in Washington, D.C., um, great co-working place there in downtown. Uh, definitely go check those folks out if you happen to be on 7th Street there in downtown uh, D.C. Um, go check out Impact Hub, uh, become a member, that kind of thing. Um, but Washington, D.C. is my number one. And, and here's why. Um, D.C., which is commonly referred to as Chocolate City and whatnot, is um, extremely diverse. Um, one of the more diverse... Um, Locations that's on this list and diverse locations that's in this country. One of the things that Amazon is having to deal with in all of its growth 
is and as they acquire businesses and corporations and things like that, is there's going to be a lot of antitrust legislation, a lot of antitrust lawsuits and things like that that they're going to have to contend with and they already are contending with. What better place to be than in D.C.? (laughs) If you're going to have legal matters and things like that, you need to be able to lobby and you need to be able to have connectivity and relationships to um, politicians, to movers and shakers, to the business community, particularly there in D.C. And then, of course, the White House, uh, the Senate, Congress, things like that. So having that connectivity is obviously big in in my um, estimation and in my opinion. The ability to travel from D.C. to Seattle is definitely there. Uh, D.C. obviously has the airport capacity and things like that. It probably won't be in downtown or you know any of that area by the Capitol and all that. You're probably looking at uh, Montgomery County or um, you know kind of northern Virginia. I, I don't know how much land they've got going into the Maryland side, but my guesstimate would be you would look at northern Virginia as an area where you could build the kind of campus that's going to house 50,000 people. Uh, traffic in D.C. sucks, just like Atlanta and just like uh, some parts of Ch- or most of Chicago, New York, and some of these other cities, L.A. Um, but I think if you were to go more into like northern Virginia, you could kind of offset uh, some of that challenge. But um, you, you definitely have the, the connectivity to um, you know, politics there. And, you know, of course, you've got a transportation hub. So your ability to to, uh, you know, move people, you've got underground, uh, you know, uh, you know, transportation, you've got bus transportation, that kind of thing there. Um, and you've got several different communities that make up D.C. Uh, with, again, a lot of diversity, which that diversity, I think, would be attractive to millennials. They'd be attractive to the engineering uh, talent and things like that that's already there and would prove attractive. Um, and also when you think of, you know, the, the people that would work for Amazon is you got their families and the ability for, um, you know, family members and things like that to be able to secure jobs and start businesses and things like that. And D.C. presents that because of uh, one being the federal government there. So that's always hiring and uh, is always looking for talent and for the most part pays, uh, you know, fairly well. So um, all these reasons get to why I believe that uh, D.C., Y'all is going to be uh, the best thing. Reginald Mitchell here on Facebook says uh, he lived in D.C. for three years and loves D.C. Yep. I'm telling you, man, Reginald, I, I love D.C. too. I uh, lived there for a short period of time and just love it. Um, let's see. I did not know they want to house 50,000 employees. D.C. and Austin makes sense. Yeah, Reginald. So, you know, their, their HQ generally is going to have 50,000 employees. That was going to be a challenge for a lot of the cities. Right. Memphis included. Because uh, Memphis taking in fifty thousand people that are making an average of seventy to eighty thousand dollars a year are going to obviously you know the economic um, impact is huge right in the positive sense. Um, but the challenge is is you got to be able to meet the needs for those people. You got to have the school systems. You got to have uh, the infrastructure. Could you imagine in, in Memphis if you added fifty thousand people to our infrastructure that are all going to be getting up in the morning, traveling, traveling in the evening time? You know, you you got to have the infrastructure. Um, one of the things uh, to Reginald Mitchell's point that I actually uh, spoke to some people downtown about Memphis was offering them Autobahn Park. I would gave them the whole damn thing, including Oak Court Mall and everything else. And damn all the ownership and all that. Um, I know that's all in place, but um, that would have gave them that whole campus, that whole golf course right there, right by. Um, uh, what is it? The uh, the uh, the outdoor part. Uh, you got Audubon and you got um, whatever the little area is over there. But I would have gave them that whole area. The problem is, is between Poplar and Good Lit and Park Avenue, all that stuff's like two lane, and you you're just not gonna be able to do that when you add fifty thousand people to a campus like that. But I would have offered them the whole damn thing and let them build it. I would gave it to them. And I would let them, you know, build up the campus and 
uh, you know, the, the revenue just from that would have been, you know, just off the charts. So that whole area right by the University of Memphis, not far from it, where you would have built up that entire campus, um, gave them, Oak, give them Oak Court Mall, give them that golf. We got enough golf courses, right? There's plenty of places you can go play golf here in Memphis. So give them Audubon that, and let them build up the whole campus right there. That was just my opinion and just thought. If you're trying to keep it in the city, no way uh, they would have found uh, that kind of space in downtown Memphis uh, to be able to do that. Although that's probably what they would have loved to do is to have Amazon downtown. But uh, with Service Master just going down there and, and whatnot, it would have been way too much of a strain unless you're going to be way ahead of the game. And uh, we haven't really proven that we're going to do that. But um, so D.C. is my top one. Um, you guys, you know, who are your top cities? Uh, let me know. Uh, email me, Ron, at com. Go to my Facebook page. You can go to the Minding Your Business podcast uh, page. You can go to my page, Ron Brooks, on Facebook, and then at Champ Ron on uh, Twitter and on Instagram. Let's see. Uh, Jennifer, my, my sister Jennifer. So she says, uh, why in 2018 on this side of heaven are people still building two-lane roads? Um, you know, that's a great <laughs> that's a great question, sis. Um, I don't know if, if they're as much being built as uh, people don't upgrade them. So what happens is uh, the, the next question or the bigger question would be is why have people not upgraded them? And of course, in southern cities and things like that, um, and, and kind of more rural towns and cities, you still have uh, a lot of two lane roads and things like that that are traveled in a major way. And there just has to be an investment in that infrastructure. And if you're not going to invest in that infrastructure, it's going to be difficult to then attract uh, something like an Amazon where uh, there's going to be a, a, a stark demand on uh, logistics. Um, their vendors have to be able to come in. Their employees have to be able to navigate. Their executive teams or teams have to be able to navigate. Um, customers have to be able to navigate. Um, the local community has to be able to navigate it. And so that puts a, a huge strain uh, when your logistic infrastructure. And again, that's the challenge with Memphis is that there's, there's not the transportation hub. Everything in Memphis is reliant on owning an automobile. You know, in a city that has uh, poverty concerns like we do. So uh, that's where you get that. Let's see. Shonda says they don't want the growth in those cities, towns. Um, it, it may not be that they don't want it. It's just you, you can't have it both ways. You, you got to invest, you know, Shonda, to be able to get it right. So towns that are still small or are still trying to keep, you know, that sense of kind of uh, the charm by keeping those kind of small, you know, uh, infrastructure logistics uh, layouts or platforms are going to find it difficult when a large major corporation like an Amazon shows up that, you know, to be considered for, um, you know, their headquarters. So a lot of towns and cities look at the upside with the revenue potential that could come and the type of people that they bring to the community or, or that kind of thing and the visibility of it and the fiduciary piece of it, what it means for your nonprofit communities and things like that. When you bring in an Amazon with 50,000 folk making 70, 80, 90, a hundred thousand dollars a year, that's kind of the thing. So until, you know, those towns make that commitment, if they're willing to make that commitment, you know, and and some just hope that, you know, uh, Amazon just chooses them, you know, Uh, they may not be willing to make that kind of commitment. So, my boy Darnell Williams, who I saw when I was uh, last, I uh, grew up with him. Um, Darnell is there actually in D.C. He says there's too much traffic in D.C. Yeah, brother, I agree with you. Um, when I was just there with you, uh, Darnell gave me a ride to the airport. Uh, shout out to him when I was there last in uh, September. And uh, I got, you know, I could see again, you know, had to get back used to uh, being able to see that kind of traffic. So, yeah, within the main core, Darnell's right. Uh, traffic is atrocious in DC. Um, however, what you know, you know, what I would think they would do to overcome that would be 
uh, being kind of in the Northern Virginia area where the campus would be held. And then, you know, their leadership teams or whatnot would be probably traveling into the city. So they would have to find a workaround uh, with that. But uh, I, I believe that uh, they may be coming your way, Darnell, man, uh, as far as with Amazon. And uh, you're probably one of the people, uh, given Darnell's background, uh in cybersecurity, he's one of the people that uh, they certainly would want to make sure that they're connected with. So uh, they may be coming to see you, brother. <laughs> so, but y'all let me know um, what y'all think. Uh, share with me if you agree, disagree. Uh, if you think maybe some other city should have been considered, let me know your thoughts on Memphis uh, as a uh, target or no longer being on the top 20 list. Uh, and just, you know, share with me. Uh, Shonda Milan says Memphis would have to expand their public transportation, but the residents don't want it out in Arlington, Millington and Lakeland area. Yeah. So one of the challenges you got, Shonda, with that, it's a good point. Um, Memphis is in a tri-state area. So when Memphis puts out an application, the challenge is, is that Amazon could look not just within the core greater Memphis area, but they could look at Crittenden County. They could go up north into Dyersburg and some of that area. And then they could certainly look at DeSoto County. And so that becomes some of the challenge um, when Memphis puts in something like that. Uh, in terms of them looking at like an Arlington or a Lakeland or something like that, they most certainly could. Uh, most of these cities, what they're going to end up looking at is some version of a suburban area in a lot of cases, because um, within the core of the city, there's just not the uh, space infrastructure available, again, to house that kind of campus without any kind of major renovation and things like that, which could happen. And D.C. certainly could do that. New York could do that. There, there are places that are cities that could definitely do that. But even in Austin, they're not... It, I, I find it a little difficult to say that Amazon would be in downtown Austin. They, they're they probably going to have to be somewhere um, kind of around. But honestly, if you're Arlington, if you're Lakeland, any of those cities, you love to be able to do it. Um, but then, you know, Memphis, the ability to travel out of Memphis is just a challenge. Our airport, uh, cur as currently constructed today, does not have uh, the ability to fly with any kind of um, reasonable number of flights, the number of direct flights, and then um, overall the cost of being able to travel uh, in and out of Memphis is just still a challenge. So, you know, all those things would have to be worked on. Um, that Darnell's laughing. Yeah, man, Darnell, you know they coming to see you, brother, man. They, you know, Amazon's got you on the radar, man. They're going to come see you specifically because they're going to want to be connected to people like you uh, if they're not already. So, but again, um, you know, thank you all so much for joining on the podcast on next week. Again, we're going to talk about next week is episode 31. We're going to talk about uh, personal and professional development and it's going to be off the chain again. So I'm Ron Brooks. Um, thank you so much for joining. And uh, I'm going to sign off on the Facebook live. Uh, peace to y'all. And thank you all so much. If you're on the podcast, Make sure that you go to iTunes, go to Google Play, wherever it is, SoundCloud. Give us a positive rating. Visit www.mybpodcast.com, and we'll see you next time. Peace.